Hello and welcome to the Children of Mary podcast. We do the best we can to be Mary's children and to make this her podcast. And today's episode is very important. As many people know, we're always promoting the four rosaries a day, but people want to go deeper. They want to give their whole hearts over to Mary. They really want to allow Mary to live in them and for her to use their graces, to use her graces to change the world. So in this program, we're going to talk about St. Louis de Montfort's The Secret of Mary. But before we do, let us see who's in the room with us today. So we weren't here last week because Claire was out. So Claire's very important. We, the show can't go on without her. You'll notice that Keenan is not here. The show can go on without Keenan. I love Keenan, <laughs> but he's not making the camera switch. Claire, where were you last week? Uh, I got to go home for a week uh, to visit family, and I got to go uh, hiking in the White Mountains and go canoeing and kayaking and all that fun stuff. The Misty so Mountains? Good. I was about to say the <laughs> Misty, Misty Mountains. mountains. Oh, I don't know how that song goes. What <laughs> states did you visit? Um, I visited Vermont. <laughs> oh, wow. Do you know the best state to be in? I don't know, Gabe. What is it? The state of grace. <laughs> ba -dum -bum. I mentioned that Keenan's not here across from me. We have his great brother, Adrian. Adrian, thanks for joining us. Thank you for uh, letting me be here. And thanks, Keenan, for <laughs> leaving us. Well, I hope he's having. So the thing is, is once uh, youth ministry gets started here in our area, it's really like a very busy time because we're balancing work, we're balancing youth ministry. So this is the time that people take time off to go and visit and to relax a little bit before we really buckle down. So I'm very glad to have Adrian in the room with me. There's a couple of men that are very holy, but there are very few that I know that love the Virgin Mary, that live or strive to live holy slavery and total surrender of their entire lives. And so a little bit about Adrian. I mentioned in one of the previous podcasts that he was one of my students, and he has this great love and devotion to the Virgin Mary. He's died twice spiritually, in my opinion. So he died once because he is submitting his will to become a priest, and he went and discerned with the diocese. And then he's died a second time because now he has discerned that God is calling him to be a Norbertine. So Adrian, how long are you going to be with us before, if everything goes well, that you become a Norbertine? Uh, as of yesterday, one year. <laughs> so he's got one year, and then he's going to give himself to be a Norbertine. Speaking of Norbertines, do you know who's going to be on the episode next week? Frater Giovanni. <laughs> One of our good friends, Frater Giovanni, will be joining us next week. That man is a maniac. I and let me finish that sentence. He's a maniac for Our Lady. He loves Our Lady so much. He called me to make preparations to come down here. And he just kept telling me how much he loves Our Lady. He's like, Mary's everything. She's my all. She's my this. She's my that. And I was like, bro, I cannot wait to get you on the podcast. So let's go ahead and begin our prayer of consecration, and then we can get the show rolling. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed Virgin Mary, we surrender everything to you. We surrender this podcast to you. We surrender our lives to you. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know where we're going. And the places that we want to go are probably not the best places. We give it all. We totally surrender Take over our lives, possess us, make your will clear to us, speak through us, help us to be your children, help us to be your instruments in the world. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Chaste heart of St. Joseph, pray for, pray for us. us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So I have a firm conviction in this axiom. It's, it's, it goes like this. Nemo dat quod non habit. It means you cannot give what you do not have. I strongly believe that. And sometimes in the comments, people will ask me to talk about various things. For example, somebody asked me to talk about the 54-day Rosary Novena. I personally don't have a very strong devotion to the 54-day Rosary Novena, so I would not be the best person to talk about it. What I do know is that many people find it as a gateway to praying the daily rosary. I've known many people who've been like, I did that 54-day rosary novena, and then I just kept praying the rosary ever since. But you know, I know somebody who has a great 
devotion to the 54-day rosary novena. Anytime we pray the rosary together as a group, this individual reminds me of her 54-day rosary novena devotion because she will point out what the fruits of each mystery are, and she's got them memorized. So I'm going to ask Claire, Claire, please tell me about the origins, about the devotion, and, and why you love the 54-day rosary novena. Of course, yeah. I'm really excited yeah. to, po to talk about the 54-day novena um, because it's actually how I was introduced and started praying the rosary every day. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, like a lot of stories and stuff. Have you guys heard of um, Bart uh, Bartolo Longo? Yes, I'm yeah, familiar yeah. with him, yes. But, but maybe our listeners don't know. Can you give us a brief who's Bartolo Longo? Yeah, of Longo? course, of course. So um, if you don't know who he is, um, he actually is a blessed. But before that, he was actually a satanic high priest. Uh, wow. When he was younger, he, when he was in university, um, he got involved in, well, witchcraft and sorcery and stuff like that. And thanks to the prayers, really, of his family, who were very devout, he got introduced to a Dominican one day who over a couple of weeks talked to him. And by the end of the um, couple of weeks on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, um, he was converted and came back into the church. And from that time on, he had a huge conviction to spread our Lord's love and Our Lady's love. In desperation almost, he was a little confused, like, you know, I sold my soul to the devil. Like, how could I... Make up for that. Yeah, make up for that and stuff. And so he heard, as he was passing by a church one day, an interior voice say, promote the rosary. And as you yes. promote the rosary, like St. Dominic, um, you will find salvation and right. bring other souls with you to heaven. Um, and so this story comes right into Pompeii. Mm -hmm. um, and he was there doing business one day. And as he was doing business, um, he just saw the poverty of the people there. And so that's when he decided to do missionary work there. And that's where he focused on spreading devotion to the rosary. And he did that through creating huge feast days to the Most Holy Rosary, through um, starting orphanages and schools. Um, and one of the things he did was made a huge shrine and church to Our Lady. Yes. And what started happening was people started having miracles. And so the miracle that comes about with a 54-day novena comes to a young little girl who is very, very ill and sick. Um, she had been sick for a very long time. She had three major horrible illnesses um, and nothing could be done. And so her and her family on February 16th started a couple of novenas. Um, and about two weeks later, um, Our Lady of Pompeii appeared. And if you've ever seen an image of Our Lady of Pompeii, it's Mary holding the rosary, holding the infant Jesus, and St. Dominic and St. Catherine of Siena at her feet. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's pretty cool because we have a lot of uh, imagery in the Catholic Church that um, – you're like, where did that image come from? But right. have you ever seen that image before? That's Our Lady of Pompeii um, that this little girl saw. And Mary came and she said, very good little girl, um, I will answer your request. And she requested that she continues and she does three novenas. So a novena is nine days of prayer. Okay. So do three nine-day novenas in a row. So nine plus nine is 18. So it'd be 27 days. Yes. Okay. And then after that, do another nine that three nine novenas so another 27 days of thanksgiving so let me get this straight so if you're wanting oh. to do this devotion you're going to do the rosary every day for 27 days mm -hmm. asking for something yes and then the next 27 days in thanksgiving in thanksgiving yeah even if you don't get what you want yes and that's a really <laughs> wow. cool thing so for me what happened in my life is um we had a really great priest that came to my college and that was talking about um during lent you should really focus on doing some type of prayer and he said perhaps do 30 minutes of prayer and i was like wow that's way too much and so i uh actually missed the start date of lent by like three or four days, finally got into the chapel, got down on my knees, did a rosary uh, with help of YouTube because I didn't know how to do a full rosary by myself sure. yet. Wow. Um, did my first rosary, really, really excited. Um, and I remember hearing, uh, if you guys know the Catholic speaker, Jackie Francois Angel. Yes, love her. Yeah. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, she had said that she had done this 54-day novena before. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay, I really want to try this. And I looked and turns out that the day, right, the little girl who started it, February 16th, she started novenas. Um, I looked at my laptop and it was February 16th. Wow. So no I, coincidences, yeah, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so I no just, coincidences. Yeah. So I just did my first rosary on February 16th and I was like, all right, it's a sign. I better try this 54-day novena. Yeah, you better. Um, and so I was like, well, Lent's 40 days. Why not do it a couple more days after? Um, and I had 
three very important and dear devotion, like um, requests that I was praying yeah. for intentions, um, very close to my heart. And I think that's key for the devotion. You need to pray for something that you really, really want or desire because otherwise you're going to get lazy and not do it. Right. So, I so if had, you have a good why, you're willing to do the what, mm -hmm, right? So you yes. have to have a strong intention. Cool. Mm -hmm. So um, I kept up with it. I did it every single day. And that's really how I grew the most in my faith because, and they say that this um, devotion is so powerful because of maybe three main things. One, because you're making a spiritual communion every day. And I hope that we'll yep. link below these things, but I have this little book. And then you can also go on to prayerflowers.com. That's the one I always use because I always have my phone with me. So I just use that. And that's where you can also find these quick prayers. And so before each decade, there's a meditation. Okay. So you have the spiritual communion. Right. You get meditation about each of the mysteries okay. that allows your mind to know more that's about good. each of the mysteries. Um, and then it also has the fruits of the mystery. So at the end of each decade, it says, um, I bind these, if it's joyful, snow white buds, so the white pure roses. If it's sorrowful, the blood red roses. And if it's the glorious, it's the full blown white roses tinged with red. So imagine white roses, with little red edges on it. Sure. Um, and I lay them at your feet, blessed mother, for the fruit of um, poverty or um, chastity or obedience to the will of God or whatever. So you kind of really always remember. So you're really getting a mysteries. full, you're getting a lot of spiritual nourishment here. You're mm -hmm. thinking about the Eucharist, oh, yeah. thinking about the life of Christ. You're saying the Hail Marys, you're saying mm -hmm. our fathers. Yeah. That's pretty powerful. And I these additional prayers are just a few more minutes. Like it doesn't take too much right, longer sure. than a normal rosary. Um, and so for me, this was actually all I did. I, this is my only rosary I was doing every day during Lent for the first time. Um, now that I've grown more and I love praying the rosary and I'm doing the full Four rosaries a day. Yes. Um, actually, part of it is says that this is an addition to your daily rosary. Sure. This fifty forty novena. Right. So because I already have in my prayer life the four rosaries a day, if I'm doing the fifty forty novena, which I'm in the middle of doing one right now, um, it goes in addition to the right. four. So you're doing bonus work. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I've seen it that people who start this and who don't pray the rosary at all. They end up praying the rosary every day after this. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you, if you have somebody in your life who's struggling for something, who's worried about something, whether that's work, whether that's family, buy them the booklet on making a 54-day novena and give it to them and say, hey, if you really want your intention heard, try this. It's very powerful. And what they will just be doing it for their own selfish intention. But in the end, it could be that they are like, look, Claire, Claire now is praying so many rosaries. Mm -hmm. I was laughing earlier when she's like, the priest wanted me to pray 30 minutes a day. And that was so much. And I'm, <laughs> I'm laughing because I know how much she prays. So, but it all started with the rosary, the 54 it day. Small. It started and small. I should say that too, like throughout our life, I see that Jesus is very gentle with us and he slowly takes us by his, uh, his hand and like slowly introduces more devotions to us as we, so don't go all in and do like six or something like that. You have to start small, right, but like, grow. but smart. You want me to start in the middle. That's what I say. Sure. As you start in the middle, yeah. Now, I think that I, I can already anticipate the questions that are going to come in. So they're going to say, I'm already praying four. Does that mean I have to pray five if I want to do the 54-day rosary question. novena? You don't have to do anything. <laughs> it, it, this is not even a venial sin if you don't pray the rosary. We strongly encourage you to. So in Claire's ca case, she already does her four. She's doing this fifth one because she feels in her conscience that God wants her to add it to. Is it a crime if you just make one of your four a part of your 54 day rosary? And I say that's how I started actually. Exactly. So what I was originally doing was say I was doing three rosaries a day and I needed to do a 54 day novena. How the uh, 54 day novena works is that you rotate every day doing joyful, sorrowful, glorious, joyful, sorrowful, glorious. And so whichever rosary it is that day, you just add the special intentions and then you continue with your other two rosaries. So God meets you where you are, and you'll just go with that. Beautiful. Don't stress about it. And so the other part that I kind of joked about was that the 27 days asking and the 27 days in Thanksgiving, it might be that the answer is no, and it might be that the answer is wait, and it might be that the answer is yes, and you get whatever you're praying for. But if the answer is no or the answer is wait, we should still be praying in Thanksgiving knowing that God knows what's best for us. And sometimes our intention at the very beginning it's selfish, and we start out of a selfish intention, and then God purifies our motives and purifies our hearts. Um, Adrian mentioned to me that Keenan is doing, he does several of these 54 day <laughs> novenas. Yeah, yeah. For a while, he was doing two at once. He used to add them on to his four. So sometimes, you know, he's doing five or six a day. But um, yeah, he's 
he's like, I got a serious intention. I know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. And our our friend Frater Giovanni was big on the fifty four day he was. novena. He'll be here next week, like I mentioned, but he was big on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he did that also before he started doing the multiple rosaries a day. I'm sure he'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Really quick, I want to go please, back to please. one thing um, yes. you said, Claire. Uh, it's so important to remember that God meets us where we are. Yes. I remember in my, my reversion, uh, when I came back to the faith, when, when God brought me back, uh, I thought, I am so far away. <laughs> and yet, the moment I, you know, I allowed myself to receive grace, even just a tiny bit of grace, um, I began to turn around and I was like shocked. But I, I was like, I'm so far and yet it, that he doesn't really care right now that like yeah. so far, you know, so long as, as like, as he brings me back. And I, I see, I saw that in lots of my friends' lives and it's something I used to tell them a lot. And I, I kind of stopped telling people now that when I, I heard you say that, but that's so important for people to remember that he meets us where we are. Amen. He loves us so much that he meets us where we are. It reminds me of that quote. I think it's uh, Jose Maria Escriva who's attributed with it, but I'm sure many saints have said it, that every sinner has a future and every saint has a past. Yeah. So God meets you where you're at, and that does not mean that you're going to stay there. He's always going to He's going to bring you forward. So if you have a story or a testimony of the 54-day Rosary Novena, I would love to hear it in the comments. I love reading the stories and miracles of God's graces and prayers answered. Or if you have any intentions that you might have, there are people who read the comments in our videos and actually pray for all of those intentions that you put forth. So there's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Obviously, this is called the Children of Mary podcast. But I often hear people say that they've made their 33-day consecration in college or that's they view their consecration to the Virgin Mary as, as an event, but not as a lifestyle. And I my heart often breaks because Mary wants children who are active in the world doing her will. And so I thought that today we would review some of the theology and the practice of St. Louis de Montfort, particularly what's presented in his book, The Secret of Mary. The reason being is that if Mary truly does crush the head of the serpent, and Mary in devotion is the renewal that's going to happen in the church and that all renewal and all graces are going to flow through her, then if I were the devil, the devil being the father of lies, would want to introduce lies and half-truths to get us not to, to properly live out this Marian spirituality. So I really feel like the information that we are going to cover and discuss is very, very important. It's so important that in the introduction to this book, and I'm even going to read you just a little passage so you can see just how important this is, St. Louis de Montfort gives a severe warning, and he only says, he says, I'm only going to share this secret with you under three very important conditions. So he's like, this is very serious. So I'd like to share with you those three conditions. He says, I have been told this secret by the Most High, which I have not been able to find in any book old or new. I confide it to you by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost on condition, number one, that you communicate it only to those who deserve it by their prayers, their alms deeds, their mortifications, their persecutions they suffer, by their detachment from the world and their zeal for the salvation of souls. Well, I already am not qualified to receive this message, sadly. Number two, that you make use of it for your personal sanctification and salvation. So he's very careful. If you're not ready to be holy, if you're not ready to use this, it might be better that you don't even hear it. And he goes on to say, for this secret works its effect in the soul only in proportion to the use made of it. This is very important. Beware then of remaining inactive while possessing my secret. It would turn into a poison and be your condemnation. So St. Louis de Montfort is saying, this is so powerful. This is so great. But if you don't use it, it can be the very source of your condemnation. You think, why? Wow. How could this be? And you might be remembering the story of the talents. So one guy was given one talent. One guy was given 10 talents. One guy was given many. And one guy buried, buried his talent. And he was the one who was condemned. So this is kind of like a great gift from God. We don't want to bury it. We don't want to hide it. We want to use it. And then finally says, if you're going to receive this message... 
Thank God all the days of your life for the grace he has given you to know a secret that you do not deserve to know. (laughs) As you go on making use of this secret in the ordinary actions of your life, you will comprehend its value and its excellence, which at first you will not fully understand because of your many and grievous sins, because of your secret attachment to self. So he's saying that at first we're not going to really comprehend just how powerful this devotion is, just how powerful this secret is. So Adrian, we know that the secret is Mary. First, theologically, emotionally, spiritually, why Mary? Why, why is Mary involved in this great role of our salvation and sanctification? Um, it's a great question. It's a I, hard question. I think it's one, you know, before we even try to answer it ourselves, I think it's one that, that we should take into prayer and ask ourselves and ask God, mm-hmm. why Mary? Yes, Right. Ask him specifically Ask, so he can pray and answer us. Yeah, like why Why did you choose her? Yes. Why did you give yourself so fully to her? Yes. And, and all of your humility and uh, as, a, as a baby. Like, I think we start there, right? Yes. Ask God, like, why? Why Mary? And then, and then we can start to think about, you know, what it is to, to live the life of a Christian. Like, okay, Jesus gave himself to Mary to be, to be raised by her, nourished by her. Um, to live with her for most of his life, and then to think how how do I step into to you know that life as a Christian? Is Mary my mother? Am I allowing Amen. her to nurture me and to to raise me and and to make me like her son? Right? Like Christ lived a real life on earth. We start at square one, just being a child of Mary. Like Amen. that's that's square one is to be a child of Mary. Saint Louis, of course, he has lots of reasons. You know, when he says Mary alone has found grace with God. Mary gave being and life to the author of all grace, and that is why she is called the mother of grace. God has entrusted Mary with the keeping, the administration, and the distribution of all his graces, so that all his graces and gifts pass through her hands. And this is one of yours and my favorite quotes from St. Bernadine. Uh, Mary gives to whom she wills, the way she wills, when she wills, and as much as she wills, the graces of the Eternal Father, the virtues of Jesus Christ, and the gifts of, of her spouse, the Holy Spirit. Um, so God, I mean, God's kind of, he's given so much over to her. Um, first and foremost is very self, yes. right? In the incarnation. One thing that, that we like to say is, you know, the most fitting, the most fitting way for our, our prayers to return to God is, is the very route by, by which all his grace comes to us, which is through Mary. Um, it's most fitting yes, and it's most efficacious and it's most powerful. One thing that I love that it, we haven't gotten into what this devotion actually looks like yet, but a key part of that is having a sense of the presence of Mary. And so St. Louis says that Mary dwells in the elect. If you're the elect, if you're in the state of grace, if you are a predestinate soul, meaning that God is going to save your soul, you're going to be saved, that you have the sense of Mary's presence with you. So he says, Whoever then is elect and predestinate has the Blessed Virgin Mary with him, dwelling in his soul, and he will allow her to plant there the roots of profound humility, of ardent charity, and every virtue. And although I was dogging footnotes earlier, I did like this line from the footnote. (laughs) The footnotes are good when they're good. As a consequence of that privilege, Mary beholds our souls in a universal manner and more excellently than the saints and angels do in their heavenly glory. And she was she is with us really, individually, and intimately. Thus we are morally present to her, and she is morally present to us, because by her prayers, her attention, and her influence, she cooperates with the Holy Ghost in forming Jesus in our souls. So we can be sure, because you're like, does Mary hear my prayers? Just as the saints hear your prayers, just as you're present before your guardian angel, even the footnotes are affirming that Mary is more present to us than even the angels and the saints. So Mary is really present with us, and we can have great confidence that she is really present with us. Yeah, and really quick, Please, you know, more, whatever you want. I think um, we'd be terribly remiss if we, you know, if we didn't take seriously John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27, when right before, it's it's pretty remarkable, and in Scripture it says, after Jesus said this from the cross, it said, seeing that all things had been accomplished or completed. Yes. This was like his last great act, was to entrust, you know, Mary to John and John to Mary, which is to say, Christians. Yes. All, all sons of God, sons and daughters of God to Mary. Um, if we don't take that seriously, right, then 
That that was his last coming. Yes. Out. That was the last thing, you know, before before dying and, and rising. He gave, and before all things were accomplished, as it said, he gave us to Mary. Yes. That's, it's, it's central to our identity as, as Christians. And then the theology also goes, because we're called to be alter Christus, we're called to be other Christs, and you mentioned that Mary, the mother of Jesus, gave him birth, gave him life. She nourished him. She fed him from her own bosom. She protected him and took care of him. And since we're called to be other Christs, we're the members of Christ's body. Therefore, it is also Mary's role and responsibility to nourish us, protect us, console us. Some people will say that this is something that keeps us from Jesus, when in fact we are called to be like Christ. Therefore, we have God as our father and also Mary as our mother. St. Louis de Montfort says that there's three ways to be devoted to the Virgin Mary. We will fall in one of these three categories. So it's important that we can identify where we are at in these categories so we can strive for the truer and the more beautiful form of devotion. So this is the first form of devotion, which I think the majority of Catholics who are in good standing fall under this category. He says this, the first category consists in fulfilling our Christian duties, avoiding mortal sin. Wow, that already wipes out a, a whole huge swath of the Catholic Church. Fulfilling our Christian duties, avoiding mortal sin, acting more out of love than fear, praying to Our Lady now and then, honoring her as the mother of God, yet without having any special devotion to her. So that's category number one. Category number two, which I think we, the beautiful thing is I think that most of the time we're in category number two, but we're striving like heck to be in category number three. So category number two. The second category consists in entertaining for Our Lady more perfect feelings of esteem and love, of confidence and veneration. It leads us to join the confraternities of the Holy Rosary and of the scapular, to recite the five decades or the 15 decades of the rosary every day, to honor Mary's images and altars, to publish her praises and to enroll ourselves in her sodalities. This devotion is good, holy, and praiseworthy if we keep ourselves free from sin, but it is not so perfect perfect as the next, nor so efficient in severing our soul from creatures or in detaching us from ourselves in order to be united with Jesus Christ. Now, this is the third category, which I'm going to ask Adrian to elaborate on. The third category is this, the third devotion to Our Lady, known and practiced by very few persons, is the one I am now about to disclose to you, O predestinate soul, and it is called holy slavery. I'm just going to read this pa passage on the nature of it. It consists in giving oneself entirely and as a slave to Mary and to Jesus through Mary, and after that to do all that we do with Mary, in Mary, through Mary, and for Mary. So, in your own words, or in your own thoughts, what, what is holy slavery to you? And how, how are these categories d differentiated? It's uh, yeah, a tough holy, question. Holy, holy slavery is, yeah, it's a lot. Um, but it's also quite simple, and it's something you talk a lot about, and it's simply waking up each morning and dying to yourself. And saying, Mary, I live, I live today, because, right, we only have one day yes. at a time. I live today for you. And then truly living, like, living life, f you know, for God through her in, in, your, in what you say and what you do and what you think and where you go and who you speak to and how you speak to them. Every, every breath you take is, is for God through Mary. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the simple fact that we don't wake up and think that. Right. I think maybe maybe the people who, people like myself, who um, throughout the day they'll be like, they'll think to themselves, I should be living uh, totally for God through Mary right now. I really haven't done that for most of today. <laughs> but had I woke up this morning and made the resolution, um, made the firm commitment to to give myself to her and to ask her help in that um, today would not would not have been uh, I don't want to say a waste but you know going back really quick which to the is first difficult page. so let me make this yeah. very clear I have a man in front of me who's very holy who's already prayed on probably four rosaries a day <laughs> and he's trying to tell me that he's wasted his day <laughs> and he's on a podcast so. 
it, there's something interior that's going on that's yeah. beyond just our normal devotions, what St. Louis is talking about here. So continue. I wanted I wanted to bring this up at the yes. beginning. Um, the first page, you know, there's a preface. And then yes. chapter one, it says our sanctification, the necessity of sanctifying ourselves, which is kind of to what I'm, I'm speaking about. Uh, St. Louis de Montfort says, your sure vocation is the acquisition of the holiness of God. Now, I think we forget that very often. <laughs> your sure vocation is the acquisition of the holiness of God. And unless all your thoughts and words and actions, all the sufferings and events of your life tend to that end, you are resisting God by not doing that, for which he has created you and is now preserving you. So that that's like the key, right? Waking yes. up and, and knowing that. And then we can dive into the surest devotion and path to heaven, which is giving all to Mary. Yes. Um, giving ourselves to God through Mary, just as God himself did. God yes. gave all of himself to Mary. But ho holy slavery is hard. Yes. It's, it's tough. And I think when people do their Marian consecration, and this is true of myself as well, we, we can mentally agree about Mary's the quickest, the best way. Mm -hmm. And I can say, yeah, I'll give her my merits. I'll give her my works. I'll give her my good actions. Everything. It's like she's my banker. And I'm like, here, I entrust to you all of my funds. You're going to invest it really well. Yeah. And I'm all in yeah. on that. And I think most people can be. But what I was trying to point out with a with Adrian, because he's in myself, and this, this is why I say we're at the second part and we're like doing the best we can to steer the boat into this this other direction is it there's one thing that's more worthy than my merits and my actions and my prayers and that's my very will yeah. the one yeah. thing that i hang on to more than anything else is my very will and you don't have to be a phd theologian to give your will over to the virgin mary it's very simple but it's very difficult to do because on a daily basis we're fighting our concupiscence and adrian really put the nail on the head when he said it starts in the morning it starts in the morning and it's really simple to do so practically speaking in the morning you wake up the very first thing you do is say mary you just have to say the words mary everything is yours and then throughout the day it's, it's hard, but you have to say, Mary, what is your will for me? What do you, what do you want to do? So there's a saying from St. Paul, as you all know, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Our goal, as hard as it is, we should say, Mary, it is no longer I that live, but you that lives through me. And to try and have a sense of her presence, I will give you a couple of tips that I use. I struggle every day. I start the morning off really good. The first five minutes, of my day are so easy. So <laughs> I will talk to myself. And so people who work in my office sometimes think I'm nuts. Claire can attest to this. I will talk to myself. I will ask questions out loud. And then I will respond with the voice of my conscience. So the voice of Mary, the voice of your conscience are going to often sound the same. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us that our conscience is not just our best judgment, but that if we're still, the voice of God echoes in our depths. Well, we're entrusting our conscience, we're entrusting that voice over to the Virgin Mary. And we have to know that whenever we genuinely are seeking to do the will of God, which I'm going to use interchangeably for the will of Mary in this case, because I've consecrated myself to Mary, whenever we're genuinely seeking to do the will of God, the will of Mary, then even if we choose wrong, let's say I'm listening to my conscience, my conscience says, have Claire talk about the 54-day rosary novena. What if I'm wrong and that's not Mary's will? Because that's my conscience is saying, I'm going to be judged on my conscience. And because I was genuinely seeking to do the will of God, I can genuinely be assured that Mary is going to bring good out of that regardless of how it goes. The topic for today, I really genuinely think she wants us to talk about it. Even if there's nothing but buffoonery <laughs> and idiocy, it's still she's still going to bring good out of it. So basically, you're trying to surrender your entire will throughout the day. Another way is that I will write. So I have things written here, the little script for today. I have it written. So writing your conscience is easy. And why are we doing this? Because I want to have an objective method of taking a step back and just like putting it out there without my heart being attached to it. 
Another way that I do it when I'm in a jam, so like let's say I'm in a bad situation or if I'm in an emergency, I didn't have a sense of Mary's presence, all of a sudden I find I realize I'm in a conversation with somebody, things are getting out of control, I realize I haven't been doing Mary's will. One of the things that I personally do is I think of the eyes of the Virgin Mary. I just imagine her eyes. Just that very simple fact. So in a way, it's kind of like being childish in that I have to use my imagination to picture her eyes. But once I do, my my reason kicks in and says, her, her eyes are upon me. And that simple act of having a sense of her presence, having a sense of her awareness helps me personally. And another mark is confidence. So when you're in a bad situation, simply call upon the name of Mary. It doesn't have to be a long discourse. Sometimes when you go to the movies with a friend, you have your friend next to you, you're watching the movie, you're not talking to your friend the whole time, but you're aware that they're present. And that's kind of like, I have a sense of the presence of God, I have a sense of the presence of Mary, you use your imagination, and you do the best you can. And your conscience needs to be formed well yes, too, right? Exactly. And yes, exactly. Yes, very well formed. Confession. Yes. Stuff because as you keep sinning yes. or choosing wrong, yes, your conscience won't Good point. be pricked up or know what's good yes. Bad. And so Saint Louis mentions even before he gets into this devotion of Mary, is that everybody has to have self control. Everybody has to have humility. Everybody must be living a life of sacramental grace. We're all on this same path. We all have to have trust in God's divine providence. But those who do it with Mary, who receive Holy Communion with Mary, who go to Jesus with Mary, are going to be far better off than those who try to go alone. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, just you know, going back to the, how hard slavery is. Um, I don't know where I heard it, but I remember it. I was moved and changed by it. But the fact that the greatest thing that, that man can do for God. It's a sacrifice that which is most important to himself, Whoa. Whoa. which is his will. Yes. Like I wake up every day and I have things I want to do. And some of them may be good. Some of right. them may not be great. But I have things I want to do. Um, and, I'm, you know, again, on page one, it says that we, we must be living for God, you know, and specifically living for God through Mary. And the hardest thing to give up is what I want to do. And that's what was so hard about me, you know, uh, accepting God's call, you know, first the priesthood, which that wasn't that, that wasn't that hard. Um, get, you know, by his grace, it wasn't that bad, but make, you know, accepting his call to religious life, that was really hard. And I probably fought it for the better part of two years. Um, what made it so hard? My will. Yeah. I wanted, I, I had these ideas of, of what I wanted to do. Um, and my priesthood and, and how that would look. And, um, and they were all good things, right? It's not like I had these terribly selfish um, expectations. But the more that, you know, the more I prayed and the more I thought about it and the more I thought about what, what God wants, um, the, the more it was painful to surrender. Like it was painful. But the, I remember the day that I fully surrendered and I accepted the call. Uh, I'd never known greater peace. Like I, I never known. I'd really never known what peace was until that day. Um, and so I'm here to tell people that uh, surrendering and dying uh, to your own will is very painful, and it's very hard. But it's the greatest thing that you can do for for God and for yourself and for the good of souls. You know, all the saints they have the the same saying: uh, we must do all all things for the glory of God and the good of souls. That, that, that is, yeah, it's the only, it's the only end to which we should be working, the glory of God and the good of souls. Um, so surrendering and, and dying to yourself is very painful, but, but Jesus tells us in scripture, he, give, he gives back a hundredfold and we, we have to have confidence. And if, if the yoke of our Lord is easy and his burden is light, how much sweeter is the, the yoke of Mary? Yeah. And you, you hit on something very important, total surrender. So by totally surrendering my fears, my desire, my will to the Virgin Mary, my cares for all of my family and my friends, you're surrendering that to her and she's now accepting that on your behalf. So whoever it is that you're worried about, if you're worried about providing for your children and you're saying, Mary, I surrendered this totally to you, I'll do your will, she's now taking on that responsibility. It is her responsibility now to make sure that your children are fed. It is her 
responsibility now to make sure that your parents or your ch or your brother or your sister is converted. So by surrendering everything over, you're really trading in dirt for treasure because she's the one person who has the ability to help you in ways that you cannot even help yourself. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing. So sometimes it, it, this is sometimes like a mind game that I, I tell myself personally, I say, I am Mary's soldier. I am her knight. So if the, if the Virgin Mary is asking me to go and conquer this tower or to go accomplish this activity, it is now her responsibility to provide me with the weapons and with the tools. And as long as I remain in her will, I am not going to lose. I am always going to win because I am just her representative. How foolish would it be if I'm wearing her cape, I'm wearing her shield, I'm wearing her sword, the spouse is her spouse is the Holy Spirit and St. Joseph. I have nothing to worry about about provided I am staying on this narrow path that is the will of the Virgin Mary. Claire, do you want to add anything? Um, no, I was just thinking for anyone who's struggling with the word um, slavery, what would yes. you guys say to that? I would say pick a different word, but it, it, <laughs> it, basically, mean, it basically means I no longer live, so I'm going to do whatever you want. And, and he, also, he also makes the point of, and I think, you know, St. Paul uses the the phrase slavery yes when referring to you know the lives we live for christ but he makes a, a key distinction in between being a servant and slavery you know servitude ends yes right and and, and not only yeah you get you get rewards for for your service right yes. he goes with slavery your life is not your own yes and we are truly called to our lives are not our own we're, we're not called to live live our lives for for ourselves but but, and what would you say to like the Bible quote to you, like, I no longer call you slaves, but friends or something like that? Yeah, that's, that's hard. I, I mean, I know what I would say. I would say, cause, uh, we are Jesus's friends. We are Mary's friends, but, um, with slavery, you're choosing that path. Like you're choosing, I give everything to you and you're freely choosing to go into yeah, I guess a free slavery. It's a good guess. point. I, I guess know. we should say you're not. I will serve. It's not. Yeah, it's not that you've been you've been rounded up <laughs> and now like your life is ruined and over. But yeah, it's a it is a free slavery, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's God it's God's grace that, that draws us into that that free slavery. I guess I guess that's a decent term <laughs> to free slavery. You you do it willingly. You're not coerced. Now, this isn't going to, so you might think this is difficult. Now, all of a sudden, I have to be thinking on some Marian plane, and my life is going to be radically different. It's not. You're still going to, if you're a father or a mother, you're still going to get up in the morning, and you're still going to make lunch for your kids. You're still going to come home from work and spend time with your children. But you are going to do it with Mary, in Mary, through Mary, and for Mary. So when you're laying in bed, and you hear the baby crying, you're going to say, Mary, I'm doing this for you. You're still doing it, but now you're doing it in a way that is going to provide the most grace, the most comfort, and that's going to give you and make you available to the most spiritual support necessary and possible for you to achieve that goal. And you really will be doing things. You will see that you're going to change, and you're going to be changing diapers the way the Virgin Mary would be changing the diaper. At least you're going to strive for that because the perfect model of diaper changers is going to be in your mind. Also, Mary's will is Jesus's will, yes. her beloved son, because she yes. was perfectly formed to his Mary will. is an echo of God. You say Mary, there's an echo back. God, not in that she's God, but that's all she wants. She's like the perfect vessel. She's a perfect model, the perfect mold. Now, there's something important. So he says this, St. Louis de Montfort says this, take great care also not to torment yourself should you not enjoy immediately the sweet presence of the Blessed Virgin in your soul. For this is a grace not given to all, and even when God out of his great mercy thus has favored a soul, it is always very to easy to lose this grace." Unless by frequent recollection, the soul remains alive to that interior presence of Mary. I really believe that anybody, because there's so few clients of the Virgin Mary today, like just saying if you're a Catholic living in the state of grace and good standing, that already is knocking out like 80% of the baptized probably. I don't know this exact specific, but we, you get the point. So I think honestly that anybody who genuinely desires to go to the Virgin Mary, asks her to be their mother, and is genuinely seeking to do her will, God's will through her, in her, with her, for her, that she's going to give you a sense of their presence. 
Don't get stressed out if you don't have it. This isn't about feelings. This is about a conformity of the will. But this is why I bring this up. Unless by frequent recollection, the soul remains alive to that interior presence of Mary. Should this misfortune befall you, return calmly to your sovereign queen and make amends to her. So I say the morning is very easy for me. In the morning, I have a great sense of the presence of Mary. My rosary in the morning takes like 45 minutes because I'm like in it. I'm writing down notes of what I got to get done. I go take a shower. I start getting distracted by my children's work. I'm still doing the best I can. I find that I lose the presence of Mary personally in my own experience between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And I'm struggling the best I can to find it. When do I personally find that I lose the presence of Mary? I find that I lose the presence of Mary when I get on this device and I start getting worried about what's going on in the world. When I start getting on social media, I start looking at the news. I have the sense of marriage presence and I tell myself, I'm just going to check this for two minutes. <laughs> that two minutes turns into 20 minutes and 30 minutes in my mind, in my peace. And next thing you know, it's four o'clock and I'm like, oh, great. Let me go to the chapel now. Let me re recollect myself. Mary's saying to me, you failed. You did not keep a sense of my presence throughout the day. Did you do what I wanted you to do today? I don't know, Mary. I never asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, it's time for you to get your act together. <laughs> so that's why I say the external practices are important because they want to bring about an interior conversion. So that third method, we're going to be constantly fighting against our self-will and our self-love. Claire, what are some external practices that we can use to help recollect ourselves and bring back that sense of Mary's presence? Saint de Montfort says in the Secret of Mary, um, the, to do your consecration to, to renew it yeah. that day. And then your renewal day. Yes. Um, to celebrate her feast days, especially the assumption. Yes. No, no, um, the annunciation, the annunciation, all of them, but the annunciation them, particularly but the annunciation yeah. Yeah. is the most important or most emphasis he puts yes. on it. Um, and I mean, those are the ones that he said, and I'm sure there's other ones externally that we can do like wearing the brown scapular and miraculous metal. Right. Um, and those are all exterior and putting, um, I think putting holy pictures, interior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Holy pictures, carrying your rosary with you. Um, any other exterior practices that you find that help you to recollect you whenever you're out of the, out of the zone, out of the sense of something Saint Alfonso Segori is really big on was that when whenever we pass an image or a statue of Mary to intentionally pause, like clear our head, call to mind God's presence, and you know to say a quick Hail Mary, yes. and that throughout your day by doing that. You know, and and she herself is kind of placing herself in, you know, a, along your path. Yes, and to to take the, those twenty seconds to stop, to clear your head, and to, to really just honor her and, and to ask for help. Now, one thing that you've told me before is that you find that the rosary acts the rosary by praying it throughout the day kind of acts like a reset. Can you tell me a little bit about that, or it recenters you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I I. I want to tell a story that sure, kind of please. Uh, touches on this. When it, get, it was a, probably a year ago, maybe even this week, I started um, my first day of classes at uh, a Catholic university while I was in, in seminary. We take our classes at this university. And we had a Dominican sister teaching us. Um, very holy lady. Very, very smart. And first day of class, she just invited us to ask questions about her so we get to know her. And... Uh, at the end of class, she was about to wrap up, and I asked her, I said, what, sister, like, what are, if you, if you don't mind sharing, what are some of the great, you know, what's maybe the great single greatest fruit of praying your rosary throughout the day? Because, you know, of course, I saw it yes. just hanging on, on her hip, on her habit. And she paused, and she, she smiled at me, and then she looked down at her rosary, and she kind of held it in her hand, kept smiling, and looked back at me, and she said, the peace the peace that I get continually throughout my day by, by meditating on the life of Christ with Mary um, is, is the greatest fruit. And, and that, that res resonated with me and it reminded me, because I think at the time I, you know, every now and then we so often fall into this, uh, you, you go through the motions and you forget that you're, you're, we pray the rosary out of love. We pray out of love. All, yes. all prayer um, is rooted in love. And she reminded me that that I, you know, praying the rosary brings so much peace yes. throughout the day. In a world that is wrought with, with um, you know, 
so much division and, and anger and anxiety and confusion, returning to the life of Christ, returning to the heart of Mary, it, it reinstills that peace throughout the day. And uh, that dear sister reminded me of that. Beautiful, beautiful. Claire, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, I was just soaking what Adrian was saying. It's beautiful, huh? <laughs> yeah. I love it. And it's so true. That's why it's so beautiful. It's like so simple, the simplicity of the messages of God. I will conclude by saying that although it sounds like you're losing a lot, giving up your own will, and in the moment it is very difficult to do, I personally have found it so beneficial. At the end of the day, I'm, when I do it completely and I'm doing it from morning to night, I feel so thankful that I did not give in to my own will and to the, the quick satisfaction or the quick pleasures that we want. At the end of the day, I'm like, I enjoy my children better. I enjoy my wife better. I've done my work better. I just have so much more confidence and peace. And she's not going to take the crosses away from you. She, in fact, you may even get more crosses because you're doing and you're overcoming so much. And there's no salvation without sacrifice. So, so other people's salvation will come about unless you're make, willing to make sacrifices. But it's so much sweeter. It's so much more beautiful. It's so much more peaceful. And I'll conclude with this uh, concerning the end times. So St. Louis de Montfort says that in the end times, it is these who are living holy slavery that are going to be like, you know, young Davids with slings just shooting the Goliaths everywhere they go. So he says this, through Mary, Jesus will reign as it is through Mary that God came into the world the first time in a state of humiliation and annihilation. May we not say that it is through Mary also that he will come the second time <laughs> as the whole church expects him to come to rule everywhere and to judge the living and the dead. And I'm skipping a little bit. We ought also to believe that toward the end of time and perhaps sooner than we think, God will raise up great men and women full of the Holy Ghost and imbued with the spirit of Mary through whom this powerful sovereign will work great wonders in the world so as to destroy sin and to establish the kingdom of Jesus Christ, her son, upon the ruins of the kingdom of this corrupt world. And these holy men will succeed by means of this devotion of which I do but give here the outline in which my deficiency only impairs. So if St. Louis de Montfort is deficient in expressing what this devotion really means. We too are deficient, and I apologize for all of our insufficiencies. But to summarize, basically do everything with Mary, in Mary, through Mary, and for Mary. And I can assure you, you will be most pleasing to Jesus Christ. Adrian, will you conclude with the Hail Mary for us, please? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. If you would do me a favor, if you're still listening to this, you've listened to this whole hour-long podcast or however long it is, do me a favor. Go to iTunes, go to Spotify, go to Google Podcasts, leave us a review, Five stars is what I would give it because <laughs> this is one of the only podcasts that I listen to from beginning to end, and I'm in it, and I'm You're not listening. <laughs> I'm not listening to it because I'm in it. I'm listening to it because I personally need to hear it. <laughs> so, if you don't think it's five stars, do not go to iTunes. Stay home. <laughs> Sit this one out. <laughs> All right. God bless you. God love you, and we'll see you soon.